Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 368 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. Check them out at performbetter.com. I'm your host, Anthony Renner. The show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. All right, on the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv, Coach's Corner spoke with Coach Boyle about a couple of Twitter threads, actually. One on maintaining strength in season with rep ranges of, really, Coach Boyle uses five to nine, but, you know, anything from eight to ten as well. Talked all about that. Using... Hit the old hit H I T training for in season, how he would use that language in strength and conditioning. That was a big one on Twitter, got a lot of back and forth. And then talked to him a little about an Instagram thread that he posted uh, on uh, tempo runs. Guys, for the AG1 Athletic Greens, hit the gym with the training coach segment. I have on Dan Hellman, physical therapist, founder at H3 in Florida, uh, another golf digest top 50 golf trainer as well i know dan from uh my time with titleist performance institute as well we're going to take a different look at fascia why muscle is a stupid piece of meat why it's important to look at the direction of fascia that's a big one with dan why foam rolling might not be the best option for soft tissue how the fascia plays into injuries how fascia can be a computer in the body how we can recover better, myofascial stretching, and Eldoa. That and so much more great one coming up from Dan in a little while. AG1 Biathletic Greens, 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strength coach and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. All right. For the Nomly maximizing the member experience with Sumit Seth, founder of Nomly. Today, Sumi's going to talk about delivering a feeling of delight and joy with the art of surprise with your clients. Some really great suggestions. Uh, it doesn't matter if you own a gym or just a trainer, a big gym, whatever it is, uh, you can use these concepts anywhere. Guys, make sure to check out the monthly webinar training series on Perform Better. Uh, the Perform Better app, actually. It's all free. There's some great lectures from Josh Hankin and Jessica Bento from uh, DVRT Training. And they do it every month. You can also catch them live, but they always put them on the app. And speaking of the app, the app is free. It features education from some of the world's best trainers, coaches, and therapists. Lots of different webinars and lectures. And then a lot of stuff from all of the different summits so really cool check it all out at performbetter.com you can also get those obviously those apps at um your app store lots of things to get to so let's get on the phone with coach boyle all right now it's time for the strengthcoach.com and nbsc.tv coaches corner with coach boyle you can try strengthcoach.com out seven days for free Go to shrinkcoach.com for your seven-day free trial. Coach, happy birthday. Thanks, Ant. 64. Yeah, man. Hey. Getting there. Almost in Social Security. All, all, all old jokes aside, I mean, I feel like you're just one of those guys that I, I feel like I'm the same way. Like, I don't, I don't feel like I want to ever, quote, unquote, retire. Obviously, you, you Decrease your workload and that type of stuff, but you feel I feel like you're you know, you're more active than ever, like on you know the social media stuff. And um, what what are your thoughts on that? I wasn't even planning on asking that, but I you know it's funny. I don't want to retire. I don't want to stop working. I want to work less. I want to get more comfortable with working less because that's part of the problem. I feel like I should be working more because because I am, a, you know, I still a part owner of the business. So I want to get more comfortable with the fact that it's okay to, to not be there. And I'm getting better at that. So I think those are, are probably the big ones. I just work a little bit less, but, and I like doing, it's funny, the social media stuff I've been playing. I always, there's always things that pique my interest. 
I always enjoy, I, you know, I, I think you probably read my little uh, social media blurbs. I sort of enjoy playing at Twitter in the morning. I like to get up and kind of mess around. And I, I have to admit, I like a good, um, I like a good back and forth, a good, I guess, argument you could say. And uh, we got a couple of them today. Couple today, yeah. Try, yeah. try. I'm convinced. I, I don't. The one thing there's sometimes when I'll just look at it and say, ah, oh, we'll just agree to disagree. And then there are other times where I think, no, I'm, I'm right about this, and, and I'll keep going all day. Like I'll go. Yes. As long as it takes. <laughs> I, I did notice that with the language one, and I, I thought the other kid, and we'll, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but I thought he had some good points. But you know, you, you kind of wore him down a little bit. And he uh, he definitely kind of he agreed with you the whole time, but he was just trying to make kind of a different point. But let's talk about the the Bob Alejo post, which I thought was really interesting and, and really some of it made a lot of sense. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. And, and I'm going to I'm going to ask about it. So Bob was saying it was a discussion he had in the MLB years back. Laughable, really. Many fact that's what he said. Many factors contributing to the lack of significant injury reduction and strength and conditioning certainly should be scrutinized as the sports science, medical and nutrition areas in all professional arenas. So what it was, was the he asked the guy if he lifted heavy in season. They said, no, we lift in the rep range of, of eight to twelve. We don't want to get them sore or tired. Bob said, isn't that a lot of reps? Won't players get sore or tired? No, we use a weight that does not get them sore. We use light weight. And he said, let's summarize what we have. Weight that's not heavy enough to acquire strength, therefore not heavy enough to maintain strength, not heavy enough to put on or maintain muscle, and loads are submaximal for the repetition zone. Hmm. If you're not doing any of those things, then what are we doing? Now, one thing is, um, this guy, this was kind of a, we, we, you brought it into kind of a different, uh, area. Cause you said serious question. If you do eight to 12 at a heavy enough load, that's completely different. Do you right. think you can maintain strength? And I, I feel like Mike and correct me if I'm wrong. If your one RM is a hundred pounds and that means your eight RM is, is, is 80 pounds, right? Yeah, um, so- 77 and a half, probably. Okay, there you go. Wow, he knows the chart. <laughs> Jesus, I should have. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, so <laughs> the theory is that if you could do that 77 and a half for eight, then technically you could do the one for, you know, a hun- you could do that 100 pounds for one. That's your- so to your point about if, we're he- if we have a heavy enough load, if we're going to use that 77 pounds and we're going to do eight reps, I'm- aren't they kind of equal? I think so. I guess the difference in, you know, Bob is a lot. I mean, Bob and I are so much alike that it's kind of funny, yet we're so different in terms of we both really believe in what we do and we both think that we're right. And we both love to play a little bit of devil's advocate. And that my whole thing was that we generally don't go above eight. We might go to 10. We'd probably never go to 12 in season. But I just don't think when you look at kind of the the one by 20 research and you look, I just don't think. You know, Bob, I think, oversimplifies it. And so Bob is on one end in terms of he'd like to be, you know, maybe maybe spending a little more time under five than I would. And maybe this guy's on the other end saying, I'd like to stay and spend a little more time over eight, which I wouldn't. And I would really look at it and think, hey, I'm right in the middle in terms of in season, I'm going to probably stay between five and 10 the whole time. I'm probably never going to go below five. You know, and again, I wouldn't say never. I'm going to probably rarely go below five and probably never go above 10 during the season. So I just it was a little bit of a devil's advocate thing with me. Like, wait a second. You know, if you did this and the reality is and Bob would probably be right. That guy who was benching 235 for eight. Probably if you put 300 on, he might not get it. Because he hasn't. And I think I said that later on in that thread. There is some element of touching those weights a little bit, meaning feeling some heavier loads. And again, that's going to be dependent on the guy. But I just my thing is that it's not that simple. I know exactly where Bob is coming from, but I don't think it's as simple as Bob likes to make it. And I don't like where Bob takes it in terms of I'm not going below five. I feel like the risk reward skews drastically toward risk when I get into four, three, two, one. 
and in season. So I'm definitely not doing that, but I don't do that a lot out of season because of the same thought process. We might do some threes here and there, but it's really dependent. I don't love threes. I don't love threes in the trap bar deadlift. We've been doing more threes unilaterally because we feel like the load just isn't heavy enough to hurt somebody's back there. So it's, um, it's a little bit of a balancing act. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I, it's funny. I, I, I kind of summarize the discussions a lot of times with you and Bob that you kind of talk about the same, you, you kind of agree, but you kind of don't, you guys are just taking different ways to get there in the end. You're getting like the same result and you're, I feel like, and, but you're just taking different roads there. So I right. feel like but, and I look at it and think. I was looking at this because somebody else was talking about injury rates in Major League Baseball the other day. I forget who it was, but we drastically reduced our injury rate in the two years that I was with the Red Sox. I mean, drastically. We had we had 11 disabled list guys the first year that I was there, and we had none the second year going into spring training. So that's that's a really drastic change. We brought our injury numbers way down. We did not go below five reps ever. I don't think anybody ever did anything for less than five reps during our, our world championship season. So I, I know I saw it being done. I was right there. I did it. I saw it being done. And I think that's sometimes the difference And Bob would look at it and say, Hey, I did it this way. And we didn't, as, as he would always tell you, he did not win a world series. I think he got close a couple of times, but yeah, he did. He was mad at me that I managed to get a world series in my second year and get the hell out of there. But, so I think Bob looked at it and said, I did it kind of, you know, it's a little Frank Sinatra there, but you know, I did it my way and it was successful. And I look at it and say, well, I did it my way and I was also successful. And then you get into the idea of there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. There is not really a right way yet. You would probably find both Bob and I arguing for our right way. Absolutely. Just a quick side note. I, I, it's, I haven't <laughs> mentioned this in a while, but Bob, I know Bob really from from the bar business because my, my the bar that I used to manage was owned by a guy who was best friends with Roger Clemens. So I had a lot of Derek Jeter stuff in there and a lot of Yankee stuff. And and uh, so Bob was training Jason Giambi as his personal trainer at the time. So. Uh, uh, Bob used to come to the bar all the time. So I knew him before I got into the fitness business. I knew Bob from the bar business. So it's kind of weird. But anyway, like you said, we tend to be between five and eight. You just talked about that. But I think you could do old school hit, H-I-T hit, and do one heavy set of eight to 12 and be fine. So just so people know, uh, you know, it's an Arthur Jones thing, designer of Nautilus. Um it's not really just about training at a high percentage of your one RM, but it's kind of what they said, what I found a definition of maximizing muscle failure in as little time as possible. How would you, what, can you expand a little bit on that? Like how you would use this in this situation? How would you use it in this situation? I just I say to somebody, just put a weight in the bar and do it till you can't do it and try to pick a weight where that, if you look at the old, the original Nautilus principles were literally one set of eight to 12 to the point of momentary muscular failure. So what you were trying to do was target a weight that would that you would not be able to do another rep somewhere in that eight to 12 range. And they called that high intensity training, HIT. And it got to be very confusing because later on, intensity came to be defined. Intensity was weight on the bar. So the idea Hi, Bob Baleo would be a proponent of high intensity training in terms of he would like to train with higher loads on the bar. So yeah. they were basically people were using the exact same term to almost describe two completely different undertakings. But my only point was that you could take that old Nautilus style program of just say, hey, and that's what I did. That was my in season philosophy with the Bruins guys. Just go in and do a set, like do a set that gets you tired, that you know, somewhere in this, you know, it was a long time ago. So it probably was, hey, you know, if it eight, nine, 10, whatever it is, just do, you know, go, go, you can't get another one. And if we could just elicit those high effort, high intensity, right? Um, sets, guys stayed strong. And again, 
I saw that work. I can remember Mike Sullivan, the Penguins coach. I remember he was in Calgary, got traded to Boston. And in Calgary, he still trained with me every summer. But in Calgary, he would lose tons of weight. They were big, aerobic. You know, they their off days were 40-minute bike rides. And he would literally be a skeleton by the end of the season. He'd go from 190 to 170. And the year that he came to Boston, or the two years that he came to Boston, I was like, we're not going to do any of that stuff anymore. We're not going to worry about it. We're not going to ride the bike on our off days. And I'm just going to try to keep you strong. And it was the strongest he'd ever been during the season. And it was the most he ever managed to weigh during the season. I think he stayed above 180 the entire season. And by the end, he was benching 225 for five, which was about what he could do. Maybe, maybe in his best day, six or seven, you know, he's one of those guys who was always probably never benched 300 pounds, but probably always hovered in the, you know, somewhere between 280 and 300. So, but a lot of those days we'd just come in after a game and I'd just throw whatever I'd put wherever we started. Maybe I put 200 pounds or 195 pounds of bar and said, just do as many as you can. And I, I think, I think sometimes we can over science this thing, which drastically undersimplifies it. And I think sometimes if you can just get people to go in the room and pick up a weight and do it till they can't do it again once and see you later, you're going to get a pretty good stimulus and you're going to be able to maintain a really significant amount of strength. I don't think it is nearly as complicated as people want to make it. Mike, what, what exercises would you do? Like, give me a sample. Like, would you just oh, do like all the big six it, movements? It would be like, you know, a set of bench press, set of chin up, set of one leg squat. So we push, pull, legs, core. Sometimes we, I would literally say to guys, I need five minutes of your time. The only thing we even had to warm up for was the bench press. It was like, okay, bench press, you're going to have to do two sets. You're going to have to do a warm up set with one. Okay, that was really quick. And then whatever I want to throw on. But chin up, don't need a warm up set. Just bang them out. Go to go to you get tired. One leg squat. Even then, I wouldn't even. I would just, you know, I'd almost go till you're till you're not quite tired. But just like, yeah, get a little bit of leg work. And it was so, in some ways, incredibly not scientific. Because again, think you got a guy coming. You know, an NHL game. You get guys coming in, and they're they're pretty beat up. They're pretty tired. And you're just saying to them, I just, you know, if you can give me this much, all those little. This much is added on top of each other over the course of an 80 game season are going to add up. No, oh, sorry. Would you ever change, like, like almost say, okay, for this one, if we, if we didn't have, let's change the tempo here. Let's do some eccentrics. Let's do like, no, no not like at that time. No, I mean, because you're talking yeah. when I was doing this, it was the 90s. I don't even think I was really thinking about that. We might change the exercises. We might say incline bench or dumbbell incline or whatever it was. We might do some kind of row, but. But in general, I mean, it was, I've been a KISS guy forever. I've just been like really simple, not crazy, not a lot of variety. Just get guys in, get guys out, get them to, get them to, to move some weight around on a really consistent basis. If you just can do that, because I was writing this up the other day, and I don't remember what I was even uh, talking about, but I was thinking about with the Red Sox, the thing that we did with the Red Sox when I was there is that I felt like we improved the program. I felt like what we were doing was better. But the biggest thing was we increased the compliance. We really, really worked hard to get everybody to do it. I worked hard to get everybody to work out two days a week. Yeah. And particularly our pitchers never, we, during that season, I would tell you that there was not one pitcher who didn't get at least two lifts in a week throughout the course of that entire season. I would say we had a few position players who were a little bit of a struggle, who didn't love the idea of in-season lifting. And again, those guys, you think they're playing 160 and 168 days or something like that. It's a lot. Wow. So we might have had some guys who kind of fell off the wagon a little bit in that regard. But I, we got our compliance way, way, way up. And I think that was why we were healthy at the end and why and I think I would say at the end of that season, I can't be 100 percent accurate but i would be willing to say that that we had our whole lineup we had everybody we had all of our pitchers pitching we had all of our position players playing and ultimately that is how you win in in team sports you win by having your best players in the game absolutely that's always been your big thing i think for today tomorrow is actually our 16 
year birthday of the first yeah. episode. Yes. And wow. so, um, you know, I think you've been the first episode the day after my birthday. What was wrong with me? Well, you did. We recorded it earlier than that because oh, I had a oh, remember it was released. Okay, it was two thousand seven. I probably had to show you how to use a cell phone at that time too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, like, great post today about the language. We harped on this. We've talked about the hops, the bounds, the jumps, and it, and I think it's. I agree with you from the perspective of, um, uh, you know, yeah. Th- this is how we're going to communicate. I think Craig Turner. Uh, he had some, yeah, I like, I like these little back and forth with you. I think he was kind of, he made me think a little bit about it. And, and, and there was this idea of, you know, I think, I think it's different. It's in context when you're showing somebody something. I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm like, man, did I say hop or bound on that? Um, oh, yeah. when I, you're really, I do it myself. Yeah. I do it yeah. Um, but one thing though, Carmen bot coach bot was saying something and then you had, she had said something about those things aren't really plyometrics and you say yeah most of what we do from that perspective probably isn't plyometric so uh, that's kind of contradicting yourself there you're calling you're you're saying we're supposed to we're, what are you calling them then well i mean we should say just jumps it should say and not yes. even say jumps because yes. it's jumps and hops and bounds so i think we use the term plyometric to apply to the jumping hopping bounding of our portion of our program but in every plyometric uh talk i've ever given every article i've ever written one of the things i've always said is our initial when you jump and stick or hop and stick or whatever it is those are not really plyometric exercises again some people would argue yes it is because the takeoff is plyometric but if you really if again if you go back to the original definition of plyometric and the idea of them being reactive exercises i can always remember the early people saying it was like the, the it was the three R's: resist, react, repel. So you're going to resist in the landing. You're going to react to the landing. You're going to repel yourself back off the ground. When I hop and stick or jump and stick, I don't do that. I do resist and react, but I only get two of my three R's. I'm not trying. I'm reacting to the ground in the sense that I'm trying to hit it and create some element of stability. During that landing, I'm trying to do something with my landing, but I'm not trying to rejump. I'm not trying to use or take advantage of stretch shortening cycle, that kind of stuff. So, so you're right. It is, it's, it is contradictory. And I think that's what I'm trying to get across because one of the things that I was trying to get across in both of these arguments, whether it was with Tony today or, um, the other guy, Craig, was it yesterday? I think it's Craig, but yeah, uh, yep. Yep. Craig, uh, Craig Turner. Is that they, one, one, they failed to see that when we started doing this, it was early 2000s. And the terminology situation was much worse than it is now in terms of it was very difficult to communicate, even with other coaches in America. Um, Rob Assisi had a great post about that in terms of the, the thing that started me down this road. I was and I, I you may not have seen that because kind of a separate Twitter exchange, but I had sent a guy a program and I got a response back from this guy. I don't know, you know, it could have been an email. It could have been a, could have been semaphore. I'm not sure. Smoke signal, but uh, (laughs) somehow I got a response back. And the response was, wow, your guys are way better athletes than mine. I didn't have one guy who could hop over that 30 inch hurdle. And I was like, that's because we were jumping over him, not hopping. And I remember thinking, this is why, because I can remember first, I think the first guy I heard say this was Mike Clark at a Perform Better seminar talking about, I think it was Mike Clark who said, bunnies don't hop, they jump. And then he kind of went through this whole process. And when this was when they would first, he was doing with NASM and part of NASM was trying to standardize terminology, trying to get, trying to have better descriptions of exercises. And I think in my writing, that was what I tried to do because I can remember human kinetics had asked me and uh, they had said, we want a book that could be read by a parent, by a coach, by a physical therapist, by a kid. So when you're doing that, you really have to think about terminology and about exercise descriptions. So I really started to think about terminology and exercise descriptions and say, okay, what what would the correct names, and I think, and again, this is what I was going back and forth with, with Tony about today. I believe that the name 
should be as descriptive of the exercise as possible. And the number one thing that it should avoid is some sort of um, regional or ethnic or whatever reference to the exercise, you know, Romanian deadlift, Bulgarian lunge, Cossack squat, whatever it is. Let's avoid all of that stuff because those are very kind of, I don't know, whatever, colloquial American Somebody's going to look at that and when it gets translated and someone looks and thinks, imagine when you translate that book into Spanish when someone looks and thinks, why is it a Bulgarian lunge? I don't understand. You know, why is that a Romanian deadlift? Or maybe when it goes to China, whereas I always used to say to people, I love pull down. Well, what do you do in the pull down? Well, you grab the bar and you pull it down. That's why we call it a pull down. And I said, I gave him the, the same example, step up. Right. What do you do? Well, you put your foot up on something and you step up. So we start looking at terminology and thinking, OK. Um, again, the argument that, you know, people would say, oh, they you know the stationary lunge. And I'd be like, you can't be stationary lunge. Lunge is lunging. Stationary, <laughs> stationary. So we had to say, OK, that's a split squat. It's basically a squat done in a split position. And then. Uh, Tony brought it to me, well, what, you know, what's a Cossack squat? Well, we would call that a lateral squat, or we could have called it a frontal plane squat. That might've been also another potential term. But the whole idea was if I said to somebody, okay, split squat, if you thought, okay, get in a split foot position and then do something that looks like a squat, I think you could probably conceptualize in your brain. And then if you could conceptualize in your brain, and then I said, now do a rear foot elevated split squat. It wouldn't, you know, and you looked at the picture and thought, okay, the back foot's up on the bench. So that means the rear foot is elevated. So it's a rear foot elevated split squat. Now, if I want more range of motion, and I said, put your foot up on a, f- a six inch box. And we said, that's a front foot elevated split squat. Okay. So in all of these things, we were trying to come up with descriptive terms that people would look at and say, okay. I understand what that means. Because again, think about pistol squat. I don't know what the word for pistol is. Maybe, you know, see if you said, okay, in Spanish, pistolo. You know, you look and think, you know, if someone doesn't think like, oh, I get it. You know, your body's straight, your legs out in front of you, you look like a pistol. That might not be all that simple for somebody to figure out. Whereas if I said a one leg squat, someone might think, okay, one leg squat. I know what a one leg squat would be. I guess I'd stand on one leg. And I'd do some version of a squat. And we might have said, you know, we were one leg box squat. We were one. At one point, we called it. If you look at my really old stuff, we called rear foot elevated split squats, one leg bench squats. There's some of the first perform better stuff that I did. And the, my point is that it was always just an attempt to create a standard nomenclature. In no way am I saying I'm perfect. It's my way. You know, you need to call everything what I call it. All I'm saying is that I was one of the first people to try to put this information out there. And I can remember the year I worked for Exos, rear foot elevated split squat is actually Craig Friedman's term, not mine. Because when we were arguing, I was calling it one leg bench squat. And he was like, no, it's a rear foot elevated split squat. And I was like, yeah, that's probably a better term than one leg bench squat. We were using one leg bench squat thinking, you know, one leg squat, back foot up on the bench. But he was like, yeah, that's not like someone, you know, we were always thinking, we wanted these templates that we could send to anybody. Yeah. And they'd be able to look at it. You know, you think about great cook, half kneel chop, half kneel lift. What, you know what I mean? Tall kneel, half kneel, yeah. Tall yeah. kneel, half kneel, right. You know what I mean? You know, all of these things you're trying, because now I want a physical therapist to be able to look at that. I want a physical therapist to look at it and say, well, what do they mean? Okay, I think I know what they mean. You know, they're saying half kneel chop. And then I look at the picture and I think, okay, I can probably conceptualize. And that's why even in the book, sorry, I'm getting a little bit passionate about this. I apologize. Um, it was very important that we had before and after picture. Or I'll start and finish pictures. I said all the, a lot of these exercises need to have two pictures because we need for somebody. And then we used layered pictures and we use layered pictures again in my in design oh, yeah. and facilities. Layered pictures where people could see the sequence because and this is what drives me crazy, whether it's a guy like Tony or a guy like, um, I, now I forget the other guy's name again, but Craig, um, Craig you know, like these guys, they probably 
were five when I wrote this book. Like they don't understand the struggle that was going on in terms of trying to create standard nomenclature. So instead they choose to argue and say, oh, just leave it the way that it was. Or who cares what those names are? It's like, no, you don't understand because you have the benefit of 20 years of this going on. So you can look at it and say, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, you're being nitpicky, much ado about nothing, whatever. But I would look at it and say, no, not true. Because we've been working hard, whether it was me or Mark Verstegen or Gray or whoever it was, we've been working really hard to try to push the profession forward by creating a standardization of terms. A lot of other things too, but I think that's one of the things yeah. we really tried to do. Well, so that's I call <laughs> I call it the belly press, but the Palo press came out of MBSC. You should be. It's not yeah. mine. It's Palo. <laughs> I will. I always, if you look and I tell Palo this all the time, I always say anti rotation press. I never say Palo press, mainly because I will never give him the credit. Uh, uh, there you go. I knew it. And uh, for me, I call it a belly press, but um, I just feel like belly tells people where to. I, I like right. them to keep it on that. So if, yeah. if, anyway, um, Mike, you got to. Great post. Everybody check it out. I will link to it on um, on the show notes about tempo running. And basically, he said, tempo running is submaximal running-based conditioning work that we use often early in our athlete training programs and maintain as a low-intensity stimulus over the course of the entire program. Uh, repeat running efforts done roughly 70-75%, intensity for 75 to 100 yards, typically 8 to 14 reps per workout with one minute rest between reps. Mike, so just, I want to clarify for people because I know they were going to ask this. Um, what um, this, so, because now we have the sprinting too. So is this first phase, hey, we got to, you guys got to do this first to get the tissue prepared, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Is this a first phase thing? And then slowly add the sprinting and then you, so you decline. No, sprinting, sprinting goes right into the beginning. So they're, they're being done in parallel to each oh, other. Oh, they are. Okay. We're starting right off with sprinting. So on two of the days that we're sprinting, and then basically on the it's all in the same day. We're sprinting before, we're lifting. Afterwards, we're doing these tempos, which really would cl- theoretically probably be classified as extensive tempo. But I think we've gotten away from using the terms extensive and intensive. But we would start with extensive tempo with the idea that we just want to get people moving in that sprint motor pattern to prepare us for the conditioning that's to come. But that would be very much separated from sprinting. But like with sprinting, that's why we start with five yard flying walk. So we're gonna we're gonna have a really low dosage of sprinting. I started writing an article about this the other day because I'm trying to explain to people why we're doing it the way that we're doing it. But um, we might start out in day one or week one might be two times fifteen yards. So ten yard flies with five yard fly ins. So you might do. 30 yards of sprinting on Monday and 30 yards of sprinting on Wednesday or 30 yards of sprinting on Monday, 45 yards of sprinting on Wednesday. And then we're going to slowly add to that with maybe one more sprint. We might go for, you know, we might get three or four a day and then start to push out by five yards in terms of the flies. So we're gradually, we're, we're incorporating that progressive resistance concept into sprinting. And at the same time, we're increasing I, again, we're adding yardage on the other end from a tempo running standpoint in terms of getting people now ready for what's going to eventually be some more stop and start type running, you know, shuttle runs, those kind of things that would be more intensive conditioning, not necessarily intensive tempo, but more kind of classic interval training type stuff where now you're going to shift over to timed work, timed rest you know, 30 seconds on, a minute off, that kind of stuff. So the conditioning gets more intensive as you go, literally more intense, gets harder. Whereas the tempo stuff initially is, it's designed to be easy. It's designed to not be super stressful, but it's not, the difference is it's not jogging. Yes. Okay. So again, and- one of the things I want, is I want sprint motor pattern. I want hip extension. I want the hamstrings to get some stress. I want the hip flexors to get some stress, which they don't get. If we jog, we get neither hip extension nor hip flexion. We just get a cardiovascular stimulus. 
and some ground contact, I guess. Whereas with tempo, we're getting some cardiovascular stimulus. We're getting some ground contact and we're getting some sprint motor pattern. Great. So and get more bang, and you said, more bang the buck. Yeah. And you said in the, the thread to um, in the, in the post, that, you know, just great for as well for older athletes who have trouble tolerating some of the high intensity stuff or the long distance stuff. So good stuff, coach. First of all, again, happy birthday. Um, and number two, Thank you so much for the last 16 years of the Strength Coach Podcast. Thank you Uh, for the last 16 years of the Strength Coach Podcast. All I got to do is pop on here for 20 or 30 minutes and run my mouth and uh, everything's fine. You do all the work. (laughs) All I do is find three topics that I just mentioned. I don't even finish the questions and they're answered in five minutes each, at least minimum five to 10. So anyway, Coach, have a great birthday and we will talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Welcome to Nomly's Maximizing the Member Experience segment. My name is Sumit Seth, and I'm the co-founder of Nomly. Now, let's face it. The fitness journey can sometimes feel like a never-ending treadmill. But fear not, because we're about to unleash the secret weapon that can supercharge your member's enthusiasm and loyalty. The art of surprise. Think about it. When was the last time you received an unexpected gift or found a bonus treat waiting for you? Remember that feeling of delight and pure joy? Well, guess what? Your gym members crave that feeling too. Surprises inject that much-needed dose of excitement into their lives and routines, helping them stay motivated and excited about coming back for more. But hold on. I'm not just talking about throwing random stuff at your members and hoping it sticks like spaghetti on the wall. No, no. We're talking about thoughtful, tailored surprises that'll make them feel like a million bucks and keep them booked. Personalized water bottles and other swags, VIP workouts, a gift certificate, or even something as simple as a protein bar or a new exercise in their program that they weren't expecting can not only deliver those feelings of delight and joy, but give your people a story to tell their friends. Speaking of telling their friends, hello referrals. Happy surprise members are like your gym's ultimate hype squad. When they're raving about the amazing experiences and unexpected treats they're getting, their friends will be sprinting to sign up too. It's like a chain reaction of awesomeness that keeps these referrals flowing faster than a protein shake blender. Surprises are also your golden ticket to fighting off the boredom bug. You know that feeling when the novelty of a new workout routine fades faster than a sprinter off the starting block? Now that's where surprises come to the rescue. A pop-up themed workout, a surprise appearance by a specialized trainer, or even a spontaneous fitness challenge. These surprises keep your members on their toes and stoked to see what's coming next. A gym that embraces surprises isn't just a gym. It's a destination. Members aren't just joining a place to sweat. They're signing up for an experience. And an immersive one, too. An experience that they can't get anywhere else is an experience they won't want to leave. It's like turning your gym into the cheers of fitness, where everybody knows your name and they're excited to see you every time you walk through the door. Plus, Surprises build an emotional connection. When your members feel like they're part of an exclusive, exciting club, they're more likely to stick around for the long haul. It creates a fitness family that celebrates their milestones, supports their goals, and lifts them up, both literally and metaphorically. So, if you're ready to level up your gym game and turn your members into raving fans, start planning those surprises. Remember, It's not about how big or flashy their surprise is. It's about the thought and care you put into making your members feel like the fitness rock stars they are. Until next time, keep surprising, keep delighting, and keep those members sweating with a smile. This is Sumit Seth, co-founder of Nomly. For more info, please check out nomly.com and schedule a free demo to discover how we simplify in both capturing and presenting little things about your clients so your team members can deliver those wonderful moments and set your business up for massive success. 
And if you specifically refer this episode, then in addition to a free 30 days, no strings attached trial, we'll throw in a surprise of our own. All right, hey everybody, wow, it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Shrink Coach segment brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Had some this morning, put my little vitamin D in, in little droplets that they give you, and you can get those droplets, free one-year supply of immune support and vitamin D and five free travel packs, which I did use on my recent trip to New York. I needed them. So you'll get that with your first purchase. All you got to do, visit athleticgreens.com slash strength coach. All right, today I have on Dan Hellman. He is a licensed physical therapist, owner and founder at H3. Uh, in Florida, that's his place, and he's a, it's an official training center, among other things, for the Soma training and Soma therapy. Uh, Guy Voyer's, uh one of the many uh, uh, modalities that I guess he invented. Uh, he's also, uh, Dan's also a past senior faculty member at the Czech Institute, mm. so been doing this for a while. He's also one of, who has been voted in the past 50 best golf fitness trainers in America by Golf Digest. I actually, first time I saw him, uh, speak was at a World Golf Fitness Summit. We might try and talk about that a little bit. But Dan, thanks for doing this, bud. Hey, thanks for having me, Anthony. I appreciate it. All right. I, you know, before we get into, I, I just said we're not going to talk about it. We, we're hoping to talk about it. We <laughs> are going to get to it. Pumping versus foam rolling. I think one of the things I really learned about you there was I actually went to your uh, yours and Janet's hands on, which was brutal. You guys were <laughs> killing us, and you would ne- guys, you would never. If you looked at us, you'd be like, what's the big deal? It was brutal. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. It was a, like an Eldoa uh, uh, session, and, and he did a, a talk about pumping versus foam roll. Really made, made me think. And uh, so I definitely want to get to that. But Dan, you have been talking about and, and working with fascia in mind for so long. And, and I really... This is long overdue because we we I tried I think we tried a while back to do this and uh, and whatever for whatever scheduling reason didn't happen at the time but I've been on a like a mission it reminded me to call you again because I, when I was in Long Beach I saw Greg Rose and I saw Dennis Stumpy who we had on last week and uh, Dennis mentions a lot talks a lot about fascia and and mobility and I think uh, one of the things that we're, we we've seen recently is we've realized that regular stretching, it doesn't work, right? Mobility work hasn't worked. And we're really seeing a lot more, a lot, a lot of different tools now that have come up, uh, whether that's like a stick mobility or more massage guns or foam rolling or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, we're sure we're at least we're thinking about it a lot more. And, and this idea about fashion is becoming a little bit more mainstream, but I kind of wanted you to just give us your overview of how you're looking at the fascia, because I feel like you have a, a little bit of a different outlook. I haven't heard that really from anybody. And uh, and not, again, I said, I always like to say, where are we going wrong with this stuff? You know, but not that we're going yeah. wrong or, you know, what's the direction that, you know, that you're going in with in regards to fascia? Okay. So I think my journey started in undergraduate school and then graduate school where I had the fortunate ability to do three human uh, cadaver dissections with three different anatomists. And this was, I hate to age myself, but this was back in, you know, 19, like 92. And then again in 93, 94, like around there. And all three anatomists said the same thing to us, cut the fascia off, throw it in the garbage, we don't care about the fascia. We only care about the muscles, the nerves, the arteries, the veins, the bone, et cetera. So of course, that's what we did. And of course, the focus for physical therapists at that time was basically muscular driven. And and that was my MO as well. Um, And then I meet, and that was even my MO with with Paul Check, who he changed my paradigm, right? We all have paradigm changes. Nothing's wrong. We all come to a place at the right time, I feel. And, um, and so then I meet this guy, Guy Boyer, Dr. Guy Boyer, a French osteopath. And day one, he talks nothing but fascia, 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 fascia. And I'm thinking to myself, well, 
the anatomist told us to throw it in the garbage. We don't care <laughs> about it. So it was a really interesting 180 degree turnabout and going from three anatomists that say, throw the fascia away. And then Dr. Giboye saying that muscle is nothing but a stupid piece of meat. We don't care about the muscle. It's the fascia, the bag that surrounds the muscle that is the most important to pay attention to. Now, that does not mean that we don't have muscular stretches because we do. If I said we didn't, I'd be lying. But our go-to right off the bat is going to be myofascial stretching when we're looking at particular fascial chains. Now, then I got introduced to, because now we're in a classroom with Guy, we're seeing pictures on a, on, you know, on a flat 2D screen. And then I got introduced to a guy by the name of Jean-Claude, Dr. Jean-Claude Gimbarteau. And I believe he's a plastic, a French plastic surgeon. And he came up with a technique to take a tiny camera and put it underneath the skin of living individuals and to study the fascia. And in his book, Stro uh, Jean-Claude Giverteau, I think it's Architecture of Human Living Fascia, I think is the book. But if you Google strolling under the skin, you will see, and they compare fascia from a cadaver, which, which to me looks like cement. So when you see that, you want to crush it. Like you want to just temper steal it, foam roll the hell out of it, whatever, because it looks like cement. And then you see living live fascia and you go, whoa, wait a minute. I don't think I want to smash this stuff because the fascia is all microtubules, hopefully filled with collagen. And the fascia remodels itself in front of your eyes. So that started me down this road of, oh, just get in the gym and just hammer the fascia with a foam roller. Or are there some other techniques? that we can work with this living fascia. And also, by the way, it kind of follows the direction of the PRM, which is the primary respiratory mechanism, which is different than our breathing mechanism, okay? And the PRM, I think, is every six to eight, six to eight times a minute. And when you have the manual skills to work with the fascia and feel the PRM of the person, the results that you can get are really amazing. So it kind of took me down a completely different rabbit hole from going to smashing the shit out of the fascia to treating it with really kind, gentle hands and knowing the direction that the fascia runs. So I don't want to, uh, I guess, I, I hate bringing up other people and say, well, they okay. said this, you know, sometimes, but... It seems like Thomas Myers, who, uh, if anybody doesn't know, wrote anatomy trains, he was kind of the first one that I think the strength and conditioning community from a whole was starting to hear about fascia from. And he was, he's a rolfer. So it's like the opposite. Oh, it's almost like you're talking about like smashing. And, and so could you go a little bit deeper into what you mean by this? Because, I mean, we're hearing from, from a rolfer who, if anybody, the rolfing is super painful and he's digging in. Um, and now you're talking about being a little bit more gentle. So mm. can you just expand on that and, 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 and those techniques about w sure. why you're doing that and, and why you believe that's a better way? So I think Ida Rolf, I think amazing. And mm -hmm. I think there's some amazing rolfing therapists. And I think the big difference is, is they're using their hands. And I think if they're a really talented therapist, they know and study the directions of the fascia, okay? So they're able to take their hands. And again, I'm not a rolfing. I've been rolfed once. I'll never let anybody do it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, just It just wasn't my thing, right? It yeah. just wasn't for me. Uh, but there's some, some of my athletes swear by it, okay? And again, I'm not here to poo-poo anyone or any technique. That's not what I do. Um, I've always said, if it gives you results, great. If it doesn't give you results, then go someplace else. But I think one of the big differences is with rolfing is you have a skilled set of hands on your body. And like, for example, the, the, the quad muscles, we would say, okay, they run vertically, right? They do. But the femoralis fascia actually runs horizontally around the quadricep. 
So I think having a working knowledge with direction of the fascia is going to definitely help somebody with rolfing instead of having somebody using like a foam roller, which you can't, you can't really get really good directional movement of the fascia with a foam roller or with a gun or something like that. So I think it's, it'd be a little bit difficult. It'd be a little bit bad for me to equate or to try to compare like foam rolling versus, versus rolfing because with the rolfing, you got the human being with the touch yeah, and with the foam roller, you don't. Yeah. And, and, Go deeper into this direction thing, because I've heard you and I had a conversation a couple weeks ago, and then, uh, you know, we talked about that. Yeah, that's that's kind of a big piece of it. This direct, you're obviously talking. Hey, the muscles are going one way, the fascial, the femoral fascial is going the other way. So now, just what does that mean, really, for us as practitioners as well? How does it mean? What does that mean to you? And then, what can it mean to us uh, who are working with people, just training, regular training? Sure. So I think I think if someone has a restriction, we have to ask, okay, is the restriction truly muscular? It's possible. Is the restriction fascial? It's highly probable. Uh, because remember that fascial bag is what holds that stupid piece of meat. And a lot of people nowadays are dehydrated. Okay. Nobody's drinking water. They're drinking all this other stuff. You know, it might be water, it might have something in the water, but then it has to go through your liver and then it goes intracellular and not extracellular. So now right away you're saying, well, if the person is dehydrated, do they even have healthy quality fascia? And then we have to ask, could it be neurologic? And that's when I love like David Butler's work who did the floss, all the flossing, nerve flossing techniques. Mm -hmm. I just had an individual in here the other day, uh, which I've done Butler work. And of course, I'm doing all my fascial stuff after the second treatment or third treatment. I'm not getting my results. And I was like, ah, nerve. And so I did some upper uh, limb uh, flosses and immediately he got better. So, you know, you have a, you could have a capsular restriction too. So now you got to work with more joint mobilizations. So I guess if you're just looking at purely the fascial approach, and it's different in the body. Like I can't give you all the, but like the pec minor fascia does not run in the direction of the pec minor. It runs differently. The fascia of the, like the quadriceps runs differently. Um, so there's in throughout the body, the fascia doesn't always run in the direction of the muscle. A lot of times it does, but there's certain areas of the body where it does not. And so having that working knowledge of the direction of the fascia helps when you're doing manual therapy could help when you're also maybe using a foam roller to roll in the right direction of the fascia. If I'm just focusing on muscle strengthening, and then I really want to obviously focus on the direction of the muscle. So, you know, it, it gets, you got to just ask yourself, what body part am I working on? And what technique am I going to use to actually help improve that particular body part? So with that fascial direction in mind, I'm, I'm, uh, you can see me, but so if I'm going to stretch, right, should I really be like, if I want to stretch that pack, I really need to start thinking about that direction as well then, right? Yes. And the pec, you're going to stretch the pec when it's called above the glenohumeral angle. So if I bring my arm below 90, and, and you also have to know, you know a little bit of your biomechanics. Sure. So if I bring my arm below 90, I have all of this freedom, right? If I yeah. bring my arm above 90, which is we call above the glenohumeral angle, now it's sticky. And now I can get a really nice impactful stretch on my pec major. And that stretch may happen anywhere from here through here. We have different fibers that we can impact. So again, knowing also biomechanically uh, the action of certain muscles, that also helps too with, with the particular stretch that we choose to do. So go back to, uh, you're talking about water, um, being hydrated. Um, uh, it is funny cause I, I, I mean, obviously we all know how important water is and we think it's for so many reasons, but so being dehydrated can make us feel a little bit, uh, uh tighter as well as uh, that just to go into general population terms, right? For the most part. Absolutely. And so typically like Dr. Roy would say, you know, you see these collagen filled. So when you look at a 
fascia under a microscope. You see all these tubes. And by the way, all the fascia is the same, except for really the spacing of the tubules. And we would call the, the covering of the muscle epimesium. We would co call the covering of the bone periosteum. We would co call the covering of the heart the pericardium, the covering of the lungs the pleura. So it's all fascia, right? And so if you look at this uh, under the microscope and you see these microfilled tubules, if they are not nice and fluffy and filled with fluid or liquid, now that fascia becomes more like leather. And it's not pleasant when you want to go to try to stretch leather. So I always tell my clients, listen, you know, if you want to do some proper mobility training, it always starts with what you put inside your body, right? You, you are what you eat and you are what you drink. If you're drinking nothing but soda and coffee, you're dehydrated. I don't care what anybody says, all right? And for you to be able to make gains is probably going to be not possible and you possibly could create an injury. So being hydrated is really critical when you're talking about fascia because your body is what, 70% water. So we got to make sure that we're nice and hydrated. And of course, it all depends on where you live, uh, your environment, are you sweating a lot, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. What about, um, how about the recommendation? I mean, we is it, um, is it still, okay, cool, get half your body weight in ounces, that should be enough. Obviously, again, it would, this is irregardless of what activity you're doing. That's another story. If you're out yeah. playing hockey and you lose five pounds of water, you know, we need to replace that. But yeah. what is the recommendation basically going to be the general recommendation? Um, that was our, when I was teaching for Paul Check, that was our recommendation for everybody is a rule of thumb is half your body weight in ounces of water a day. That's for the average couch potato. Yeah. Um, obviously now, if you're, if you're carrying a lot of extra weight, you got to factor that into it. Uh, you don't want to drown yourself, you know, starting out with water. Also, too, I've had clients, you know, that would clients that don't listen to you and then clients that listen to you 100 percent. Yeah. And, you know, somebody going from drinking 12 Diet Dr. Peppers a day to not drinking any Diet Dr. Pepper and drinking only water and then calling up and saying, hey, I can't stop going to the bathroom. I can't sleep, et cetera. So you, we got to do stuff in moderation and we got to use our common sense. So, you know, gradually replacing some of that diet soda with water is the is the way to go. And then slowly building up, you know, the amount of water that you drink. But as a rule of thumb, it's half your body weight in ounces of water a day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that might come uh, from Dr. Batman Gaggi, if I remember right. But I, I can't remember who had that statistic. I, I first heard it from Robert Yang. And I, I'm sure, he, you know, that was a check. He's a check. That was definitely probably from Paul Check as well. So there was um, a book. There was a book, uh, "The Body's Many Cries for Water," and I want to say it was in there, but I'm not sure. Nice. Um, so, what does this do for this thought process on injuries? Because I never hear ever. I do as it's funny. Side note: We're talking about water. I had to take a sip of water. Now I'm talking. Dan had to grab a water. See what happens psychologically. Like, yeah, got to remind me. <laughs> um, how does this change the thought process on injuries? You don't watch, you know, yes, today's what? Uh, today's Tuesday. Okay. Nobody said, yeah, uh, Johnny Smith tore his left quad fascia, right? I mean, but how how are we looking at fascia from the injury perspective? Because you only hear about muscle. Hmm. Yeah, so fascia has the ability to be able to remodel, you know, really quickly. You know, again, you can see it literally, like if you if you Google the video strolling under the skin, yeah. you will see the fascia move right, right in front of your eyes. Uh, muscle doesn't do that. So if, you, if you've, you know, gone deep enough and you've torn into the, the, the tissue of the muscle, you know, you're going to need, you know, again, this is just an average rule of thumb. But you're going to need 21 days, you know, as a rule of thumb, 21 days for tissue healing. Obviously, that's dependent on the environment. Uh, again, on, you know, whether you're getting some good quality, limited range of motion to pump the area, to move the good stuff in and pump the bad stuff out. That's dependent on your rest and recovery. You know, we know sleep is the most important thing for recovery. So that's going to have many factors uh, combined. 
But I do believe, you know, if you do tear some fascia, that is not going to probably keep you out as much as if you've gone down into the deeper, deeper layers of the muscle. Interesting. So talk to me about load and fascia, because when you were explaining fascia, it was kind of uh, reminded of, of bones, right? Like when we talk about uh, osteoporosis, for example, we're like, well, you know, the bone has to bend a little bit and then it's going to, you know, the brain will, you know, it'll send collagen or the osteolytes to that area to strengthen it. You know, there's always that saying by evil can evil. Somebody asked him, you must have really weak bones. He's like, no, I broke them all. I have really strong bones now. Um, you know, but, but talk to me about load and strength training uh, on the fascia. Are we, is it, is it anything like muscle? Are we, can we get it stronger? Do we, does it get bigger? Does it, uh, how does that affect fascia? You know, I don't, I would not be able to answer that question uh, with a lot of confidence. I do know this. I do know that fascia is a, is a major, major um, shock absorber and a great absorber of energy. Okay. Also too, and Dr. Mark Lindsay, one of my good friends, uh, do you know Dr. Mark Lindsay, chiropractor? I don't, I don't. He's worked with everybody from Sally to George. And um, <laughs> he's got some papers coming out that uh, I think is going to kind of turn the neurological world upside down. Cause you got the, you got the people that are brain centered, you know, everything is what's with the brain. And then, you know, you got the people that do NUCA and it's all about C1, C2. And what, what I think we're going to find out is that the fascia is like a massive computer of the body. And the fascia actually gives the body a lot of proprioception and awareness. And also is a massive shock absorber. So, uh, you know, I can't answer a lot to the load perspective, but I do know, do you know the, um, like the K box, the centric flywheels? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember when I showed that equipment, uh, whether you're using Desmotech or I think I have the Swiss brand eccentric, um, like when I showed that type of machinery to Dr. Boyer, he goes, wow. He goes, finally equipment that works with the fascia. And what he means like that, if you've ever trained on that flywheel stuff, you have to, you pull the flywheel and then you have to absorb the load and you have to return it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think he, I think that really excited him uh, with that flywheel technology and how it will work with the fascia where it, it, it takes the load, absorbs the load, and then you can express the load back out it, through your body. Um, but as far as like loading principles of it, you know, I'm I'm not so versed on that. And I don't know if that changes the quality of the fascia or not. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what with with that in mind, I, I another kind of probably a weird question here is, you know, we hear uh the I don't know if it's a garbage term, but like like plantar fasciitis, right? Oh, the fascia underneath the foot. And how how is that? Like when you when you have somebody with plantar fasciitis, is it really a fascial issue? And and if it if the if the fascia remodels so quickly, how come it takes so long for something like that to get to okay. get fixed? Now that I can talk to you. So okay, awesome. um so the bottom of the foot is actually three layers of fascia running in different directions. And when the body does that, it's trying to make an area strong. So if you're gonna take tissue and you're gonna lay it in different directions, right? You're trying to create a strong arch, so to speak, all right? Now, when the body puts fascials in different layers, and, and if you get a tight calf, you're not hydrated, et cetera, those layers of fascia can kind of adhere together. Okay, so they kind of get stuck together. So now, can you take a frozen water bottle and, and you know, work really hard on the bottom of the foot? Yes. Um, I think the ice is an analgesic. I think it makes it feel good. Okay. Does it fix the problem? I don't think so. 
Um, so we have manual techniques where we go with the three different directions of the fascia of the foot, because you have a superficial layer, you have a middle layer, and you have a deep layer. And each time we work with the foot, we our intention goes on what layer we're working with, okay? So yes, plantar fasciitis absolutely can be an adherence of the layers of fascia in the bottom of the foot. No doubt about it. I've seen it many, many times. So how, if, uh, and the reason, let's let's just get the cat out of the bag, is that I am, I am kind of dealing with a little bit of it right now. So I've been curious as, because you'll watch some videos and they'll talk about, um, which is interesting, they're, they're saying, don't just go in the one line, go across it. Or when you do put a ball underneath your foot, try to go in different directions. And obviously the calf is always super important. I didn't really think about the hydration piece. Can you start to use that as a, um, also as a, as a will, the, will you get somebody like, hey, you got to start drinking some more water, number one. Um, and then uh, we're going to work different. And here's what kind of homework are you giving that person? Because uh, they can't, you're not going to be doing that, you know, all day, every co- wake up in the morning. We, anybody that has fa- fa- plantar fasciitis knows you wake right. up in the morning. So what kind of homework do you give for that? So with the plantar fasciitis, you're going to also have to look at, so with the foot, the navicular bone is the bio, biomechanical boss of the foot, okay? So right away, you might need your navicular adjusted, so the person working on your foot can look at your navicular bone and maybe the cuboid bone, right? Also, too, then look at mechanics. Are you a pronator? Like if you're a super-duper pronator, then you probably have a bigger chance of having some plantar fasciitis than somebody that's not. Um, so for homework stuff for that, like after I assess their foot, I will give them usually calf stretches. And by the way, it's not just one calf stretch. We have a lateral gastroc, we have a medial gastroc, we have a soleus. And so there's different angles that I will stretch the calf in and also the soleus. And then I might just give them some really simple, like before they get out of bed in the morning, just taking their foot and just do some gentle stretching of the of the plantar fascia. And then also too, because (laughs) when we're sleeping at night in bed, a lot of times our feet are plantar flexed all night long. And if they're plantar flexed all night long, then that fascia becomes really tight in the bottom of the foot. So you might have to wear some sort of night splint or something like that to keep your foot in neutral. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things that you can do for plantar fasciitis. It's it's a really painful thing to have. And sometimes it can be really difficult to get rid of. Yeah, I wasn't sure about um, why the splints, but I didn't realize that that's what happens at night. I wasn't sure if it's just kind of like at night, it seems like the whole body gets tight, right? You wake up in the morning. Well, yeah, but I if sh- you think about it, like if, you, if you're lying on your back, your feet are like that because you got the sheets or the blankets. Yeah. You know, if your bed's tucked in tight, right? <laughs> Or if you're lying on your stomach, if you're a stomach sleeper like I am, your your plantar flex all night long. So uh, yeah, it, it's I think sleeping, and that's why a lot of people have an issue in the morning when they first get up because that that plantar fascia is kind of dried and contracted, you know, in a shortened position. And now you get up and you put your weight down on the foot. It's like, oh man, that's killing me. So to do some gentle like movement and mobilization before you put your foot down in the morning usually helps a lot. Is there anywhere else in the body where it's like that with the, the three different layers of fascia? Well, there's there's fascia crossing all over the body. I mean, you have you have like in your obliques, like the rectus abdominis, they have a little crossing pattern. I mean, it it happens in many different places in the body. Um, the the way the fascia comes down around the knee joint area, it's like a horse's rein. And that holds and helps for stability. There's crossing all over the place mm-hmm. in the body when it comes to fascia because it's really the way that whoever designed us, it's the way they designed the architecture for support for stability, but yet mobility. So is there anywhere else like that? Like you just talking about the knee. Is there times when it there's a similar situation where that pain is from an adherence of fascia? Do we know that? Uh, not for certain, but yeah. I think a lot of times like patellofemoral syndrome, um, there's a lot of things with that. I mean, 
you know, it could be a weakness of the low abs and you're standing in a big anterior pelvic tilt, which is going to cause your femurs to internally rotate. It could be the fact that you're flat footed. That's going to cause everything to internally rotate. It could be the fact that you've had a knee injury, a small knee injury. And for some reason, we don't know why, but the vastus medialis oblique is the only quad muscle that pulls the kneecap medially. And for some reason, that muscle always fatigues or it gets atrophied really, really quickly. Like look at somebody that's injured their knee and half the time you tell them to flex their knee, they have no VMO. And so now the quads are pulling the kneecap laterally. So all of that fascial st structures on the lateral side of the kneecap are tight. So, you know, I'll manually work on those. I'll pump the kneecap. We'll strengthen the VMO. And typically that takes care of the, the, the uh, patellofemoral syndrome. So there's a lot of places like that around the body where that happens. Yeah, that's so interesting because I haven't heard, of, I mean, you've, you've heard a lot of therapists say, yeah, you have to strengthen the VMO, obviously, because of you'll, you'll even look at it, like you said, but um, I didn't realize that weakness was creating the left side that, you know, the, the lateral side, cause I've had that before and he did, he worked that whole lateral side at the time. This is the nineties. It was like, well, that's the it band, right. You know, like saying that's the it band is pulling it out that, that you know, probably changes. Yeah, mind there's, now. there's structures, there's structures that actually go from the it band to the patella. So if those structures are, and then there's what's called the POSAT ligaments, they go from the patella to the femoral condyle. So if those ligaments and those tendons are tight, it's going to track the patella laterally, and it's going to wear out one, uh, one side of the surface of the patella. So instead of the patella sliding nice and good in that trochlear groove, now I got my patella riding off to one side, and now it's just wearing out one side of my patella. And it's very painful. And I'll tell you something interesting. I can't tell you how many athletes have come, have come to me and they say, I have a torn meniscus. And listen, if you MRI'd my meniscus, I probably have a tear, right? But I don't have any yeah. knee pain. This is, this is like disc pathologies. They drive me crazy. Yeah. Every 70% of the population has a disc pathology on, on MRI, right? And I can't tell you how many professional athletes have come to me. I have a torn meniscus. They want to do meniscal surgery. And I do my thing. I'm like, dude, you got patellofemoral syndrome. Right now, unless you have clicking, popping, catching, your knee gets locked, et cetera. And yeah, on MRI, you have a bucket handle tear of your meniscus. Okay, it's meniscus. But yeah. most of the time, these guys will say, Well, my knee doesn't lock, my knee doesn't click. There's no problem, but my knee hurts. Yeah. I'm telling you, majority of the time, eight times out of 10, it's patellofemoral syndrome. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about recovery and there seems to be so many different you and i were talking about all these different uh, modalities that we've seen kind of pop up right uh whether that's cupping or um uh all of these things uh and i just wanted to go over your thoughts on fascia and and what we need to look for with recovery and how we might be doing some things uh, wrong. Okay. So recovery first and foremost is always going to start with your nutrition and lifestyle. Okay. If we don't talk about that, we're missing the big egg, uh, our body physically, because we're creatures of the sun, we physically repair circadian rhythm. Deep sleep is the second stage of sleep after light sleep. And we physically repair roughly between the hours of 10 PM and 2 AM. Okay. Give or take. And we psychologically repair REM sleep between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. If you can't, if you're not, if you're going to bed at two o'clock in the morning, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do to physically recover. It's just not going to happen, right? Or if it's, if it does happen, it's just going to be mediocre. So, uh, so sleep is all, always going to be our number one recovery agent. He's our doctor sleep is our most important. And of course, what we feel our body with. And then if I'm going to be looking at recovery, I'm going to be looking at two things. I'm going to be looking at the soft tissue, which I'm just going to say fascia, okay, because everything is fascia. And then I'm going to be looking at the joints. So, and by the way, like tools like Normatex and Game Readies, I love those things, right? But to finish playing around a round of golf and just sit in your Normatech, to me, is not a good idea of a recovery. 
Is it a great tool? Yes. Do I have one? Yes. Do I rely on it slowly? No. Um, so I'm going to be looking at posts. Like when I was traveling around on the PGA Tour, everyone came in and they all had their, their warm-up routine. They all had their activation programs. I would see Matsuyama with his little stretch bands. I would see Brooks kept the benching 225. I mean, <laughs> e everyone has a different idea of what they do to activate their body. I don't have a problem with that. But what I didn't see is when the round was over, did they come into the gym and do the things that they need to do to their body to offset them being a professional golfer? Because we're not designed to swing a golf club 120 plus miles an hour over and over and over and over again, okay? That's sheer compression of torque across the joints. Plus we're the only creatures that walk on a vertical spine with a vertical spine. So we have to manage gravity our entire lives when we're upright. So when I think of recovery is I think of myofascial stretching. So, you know, there would be certain, there would be certain myofascial stretches that I would probably deem important like post round or post uh, exercise or whatever. And then I would use the, the fascia to open the joint. And that's where the LDOA comes in. I think when you combine the myofascial stretching and the LDOA together as a recovery routine, I think you now have an extremely powerful recovery routine. Of course, that in conjunction with you getting to bed on time, drinking good quality water, and eating good quality food. But typically, it's the times when after you're sweaty, your body, your, your core body temperature is elevated. Now you have the time to think about the fascial system, stretching the fascia, and then you have the time to think about, okay, I'm having a problem at L4, L5. Is there a posture that I can do that I can open the space between L4, L5 to maybe give my disc now a chance to imbibe or to give my facet joints a chance to alleviate some pressure, to open up the foramina where the nerve comes out, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, the recovery, the two biggest or most powerful tools in my toolbox would be the myofascial stretching and the LDOA. Cool. Let's dig a little deeper into both of those because uh, yep. I think a lot of people might not have heard of LDOA, first of all, so we'll get into that in a minute, what that means, um, what the, what's it an acronym for. Um, but give us an overview of myofascial stretching. What, how, what is it and how is it different? Obviously, I know it's going to be hard. People can't see you. Um, yeah. but, um, but maybe when we do a little, uh, one of our snippets for this, we'll include it if you want to show one sure, here now. Sure. So, yeah. So let's talk about my, uh, okay. Well, I say it's my favorite. It's like saying you have a favorite child when you don't really yeah. know. <laughs> The, like the stretch of the fascia iliaca, the stretch of the psoas. We all know that the psoas is a very important muscle. I mean, Vladimir Yanda said that it's a uh, it's fifty percent of back pain. Um, you know, it's the bridge between the lower limb and the and the trunk. It attaches on all the lumbar vertebra. It um, it attaches to the discs as well. When it's tight, it pulls you into a big lordosis, which can compress the facet joints. It can destroy rotation. It can create poor rotation of the hip. I mean, you can go on and on and on. But the fascia that also covers the psoas, the fascia iliaca, that, so, that fascia also is intimate with every single viscera and gland in your lower body. Your stomach, your colon, your prostate, your bladder, your uterus, it's got a link. And that was the thing about working with Dr. Boye is he didn't care about origin insertion. He cared about what was in link. What is in link with each other? And so when you stretch fascially, yeah, it says it's a stretch for the psoas, but it's a stretch for the fascia iliaca. So now you're going to be taking the body, you're going to be winding the body up, you're going to be winding the fascia up, and then we might even throw in our upper body, which is the, fa the, the fascia of the latissimus dorsi. I always call it Spider-Man arms. Yeah, yeah. And now, yeah, and now you're stretching the body in a fascial system. And it's interesting. 
when you stretch fascially, you'll know it because your body begins to sweat. Like you start to sweat immediately. If you just stretch your psoas, just do it like a generic little psoas, stretch, you don't stretch, you don't sweat. Okay, so when you're doing the fascial stretching, you are thinking biomechanically, what does that particular muscle do, all of its attachments, et cetera. You do the opposite of that, and then you throw in little fascial components. You might throw in the upper extremity, even though you're stretching the psoas. And then there's also a very powerful move that's called decoaptation. So when I get into my fascial stretch of my psoas, my last movement, which was for me is the money move, is in my brain. I pretend like I'm dislocating my hip out of its socket. So now I'm gently pushing on my knee down to the floor and I'm creating a little tiny gap between the, the ball and the socket, the, the head of the femur and the acetabulum. And man, does that magnify the stretch by 10. So that is the idea of stretching fascially. You're using all of these different setup components. You're winding the system up like a big, like a, like a big rubber band. I would say it's like a spider web. You cannot touch one end of the spider web without the other end jiggling. Okay. And that's how the body is. is everything is in link. So you're putting all the different structures under tension to get a stretch of the fascia. Yeah. And it seems like now, I don't know if this is the old Del Eldoa piece, but it does seem like when, when you're doing these different stretches, you're in some really elongated positions from, like you said, if I'm just doing the psoas and I'm doing a half kneeling position and reaching with the, the one arm and going to the side, that's the traditional psoas from a strength and conditioning or fitness perspective. But then when you do Aldoa, you're rotating, you got the Spider-Man hands, you're, you're, you're pushing down. How is the Eldoa, you said, now it comes in, into play. How does the Eldoa change uh, the myofascial stretching. Yeah. So, so typically, in order to do some of the eldoas properly, you have to have the soft tissue ability. Okay. So take example L five S one, where you put your legs up the wall. You're lying on your back and you put your legs up the wall. Eventually, you want your legs straight. Okay. So by the way, it's 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 the rule of the fascia. This isn't Doctor Boy's laws. These are the rule of fascia. To put the upper body under tension, the upper limb, it's always going to be full external rotation of the uh, humerus, full extension of the elbow, full extension of the wrist, fingers spread, and wrist pulled back. It's always going to be that way to put the upper body under tension. Interesting. To put, to put the lower body under tension when the leg is straight, it's always going to be femoral internal rotation. And pseudo inversion of the foot, meaning you're pulling the big toe down or up towards your nose. That's always going to be the case for the lower body. Okay. So you have those different rules that you use to put the individual fascia under tension. Now, sometimes if I'm going to do, let's say, L5S1, where I need mobility of my hamstrings, and a lot of times people have a tight biceps femoris, so you have three hamstrings, not one. So there's three different hamstring stretches. So sometimes we'll have a tight biceps femoris. So we might have to do the myofascial stretch of the biceps femoris before we can put them on the wall and get their legs straight. So now they're using the fascia of the of the bice of the of the hamstrings to literally pull the pelvis to pull S1 away from L5. So as a rule of thumb the myofascial stretching component will come before the Eldoa component as a rule of thumb. The rules are meant to be broken, but that's just kind of a rule of thumb. So just so everybody know, Eldoa is like a French acronym, right? Yeah. So is there any translation of what that would mean? Yeah. So instead of E-L-D-O-A, it would be L-O-A-D-S, loads. And that would stand for longitudinal, which means long. Osteoarticular, which means joint. Decoaptation, which means to, like we just talked about earlier, so to decoapt would be just like to open the space between the ball of the femur and the acetabulum. So decoapt means to open. And then it says, it, it, by the book, it's S is stretching. But for me, Eldoa, it looks like you're stretching, but to me, it's strengthening. And so you could change that S to stretching or strengthening. And 
here's why it's strengthening is because this is a stupid example. If I'm going to do a bicep curl from in a very shortened position, we would call that internal range. And by the way, there's times when I work muscles in internal range, and there's times when I work muscles in external range. It depends on my focus. If I do a bicep curl in the external range, we would call that external range. My bicep is still strengthening, but it's lengthening. And then we have a middle range, and then we have a total range. And then Guy coined the term extreme end range of motion for the Aldoa. And when you're literally in your brain, you're literally trying to grasp and literally tag the last actin and myosin filament. So if you remember the actin and myosin is like those little ores and the muscles, they slide. Yeah. Right? When you're doing the Aldoa, you're trying to go to extreme end range of motion. So you're working really hard. And so you're strengthening the body in a new range of motion, which in my opinion is amazing because it does a couple things. Number one, you're using those, that muscle lengthening to open a targeted joint. And number two, if you're training under a safe environment in the gym in extreme end range of motion, I think your chances of getting injured when you have to go into that extreme end range of motion on the on the golf course or the playing field or the soccer pitch or whatever you got, then your chances of getting injured are less because you've already trained into that new range of motion. Absolutely. So how would that be different from, not different, but um, yeah, different, I guess, from like FRC where they're getting into positions and they're doing the isometric uh, work in those different positions? I, mean, I don't know how different it is. I know I, I'm, I haven't done any FRC work. Yeah. I've seen a, some of it done. Um, I don't think FRC's approach is to open the joint. I think it's to strengthen in the, you know these anatomical positions like that. Um, so I think it's a different focus. Yeah. But I love I love uh, that idea of what they're doing. Yeah, I think they can obviously work together. Um, yeah. you know, when you're, when you're looking at, uh, different ways to try to fix whatever you're trying to fix. You, you know, um, there's Anthony, there's so much great information out there nowadays and with everything online nowadays. Um, like uh, just for me, you know, I, I, I was a physical therapist, you know, I'm a physical therapist and then I taught for check and everything I did was check, 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 check. And, you know, I didn't yeah. do anything physical therapy and. And then I met Boye and everything was Boye, Boye, Boye and nothing check. And like I said, just the other day, I'm I'm working on my guy. I'm sweating bullets. It's not getting where I want. And I'm like, oh, my God, I need to floss the nerves. I got to pull out my butler. I got to put yeah. my butler hat on now, right? Yeah. And so I think, I think nowadays it's really difficult and I'm guilty of it. I think it's really difficult not to get stuck into one paradigm. And just remember that there's a lot of cool shit out there. And just remember that everything is a tool in your toolbox and you as the therapist or strength coach or whatever you are, it's, that's what gives you your expertise is to know what tool to pull out of the toolbox at, at the appropriate time. I think that's the difficult part nowadays of working with people. Absolutely. We had Dr. Brian Waters on, he's a chiropractor, but it's not, it, the idea was he doesn't even use that word he just he he's dry needling he's art he's got all these different modalities his other the other therapist says mckenzie and so we were kind of talking about well you know when you look at these you know a patient it's having those tools in your toolbox very well said love it um just i want to make sure people because the the aldoa stuff is is not you have to see it you have to kind of experience it too. You have to experience well, it. Yeah, yeah. What's the best way? I know on title at Titleist Performance Institute, you guys have a like a good introductory course. Is there anywhere else where people can get like a good introductory without going for the weekend? Just to say, I'm I now I get get it a little bit more. How, how can they find out more information about that? Uh, listen, if you Google Eldoa. You're going to see a lot, even though Dr. Boy tried to get people not to do this, you're going to find people doing Eldoa postures online, okay? I have Googled them. There are a few good ones. 
a lot of times I notice a lot of major mistakes, like literally not externally rotating the arms, internally rotating the arms. I mean, just blatant, okay, you're wasting your time yeah. type things. Um, I, I would say the absolute cheapest way to go if you want to learn a lot of LDO and a lot of myofascial stretching is the Titleist Performance Institute, the LDO for golf, and there's even the LDO for baseball and softball. We have such amazing stuff on there, and the Titleist Performance prices are not expensive at all. Those courses should have been five times the price that Greg put them at, but we, we wanted to get it out there for the population. And that's Janet and I going, well, it's me doing all the instruction, and Janet being the guinea pig. Um, but we have really cool stuff like Greg came up with, you know, what, what myofascial stretchings would be great for separation of the upper body, lower body, plus the aldoa, you know, for baseball stride length, what, what myofascial stretches for stride and what aldoa. So I think between, you know, finding some 3Ds on YouTube, and then if you find those, just keep in mind, I can't guarantee you they're teaching them the right way. Uh, then the second step I would tell you to go to is definitely the Titus Performance Institute, either Eldo for baseball or Eldo for golf. And then, you know, if you're really interested in, in learning more hands-on in person, my good buddy Bryce Turner from Eldoa USA, he teaches, man, next to Guy, he's the master at Eldoa. He teaches, he just came back from Singapore. Uh, he's teaching Eldoa everywhere around the world. And he's a great, great instructor. So if you wanted to, you know, get a hands-on feel for it, I would go to eldoausa.com and I would see where Bryce is teaching if he's in your neighborhood. I just got to give everybody a warning, man. When you go, just be prepared because it is not, <laughs> it is not easy, man. It is. Uh, I remember the first time I did it with you and Janet, I was like, I'm dying over here, you know, and and I did it again. Uh, Greg Rose now in his lecture, among other things, he's throwing in a few of the the ones that he think are are really good, and and people will get the most bang for their buck right away and understand how important this is. Well, Anthony, but, uh, this is this is one of the reasons why I you know I had to part ways with the Czech Institute is because I I got on a video and I was still teaching for Czech at the time, but I said I first plugged Paul, right? right? <laughs> and then I made them, I said, I said, Eldoa is the greatest tool in my toolbox. And I'm going to stand by that to this day. If, if an athlete asks me, Hey, what is, I have five minutes after I get off the golf course, I have five minutes after getting off the soccer field, what should I do? I'm going to give them four or five Eldoas. And that's going to be my go-to every, yeah. every, every, every time. Hands down. I can't think of another tool right that is more powerful than the eldo love it good stuff dan thanks for doing this man uh long overdue i know I, i've said that on a couple of guests but i was like i a couple of weeks last month i said i need to get the people on that i've been saying i'm going to get on for a while and i really appreciate you coming on great to you know i haven't seen you in person in a while because we haven't done i haven't done much uh in terms of the the title of stuff and it's been i think 2017 maybe new orleans that uh that i did it but i, I don't really know about you i don't know about but, you but i think we both have gotten younger right exactly exactly I, we both we <laughs> look if you look at us are we are both in our 50s i think and uh, uh yeah yes. we, come on we the 50s are the new 30s so um, i hope so <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely dan thanks again for doing this really appreciate you brother hey this is a lot of fun and anytime you want to do another one just let me know All right, that's going to do for episode 368 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Guys, the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Don't forget, you can try the new strengthcoach.com app for seven days for free. Go to strengthcoach.com to start your free trial. Special thanks to Chris Parrier and the folks over at Perform Better. Make sure you check out that monthly webinar training series on the Perform Better app. And look, the app is free. It features education from the world's best trainers, coaches, and therapists. There's different webinars and lectures from all of the different uh, summits and all of the events that Perform Better has put it on. Check it out at your app store and or at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Dan Hellman 
for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, and performance enhancement and fascia. Guys, this was really the 16th anniversary issue or episode, I should say, of the Strength Coach Podcast. We started this 16 years ago. You can, uh, I did it last year, but you can check out the 15-year the anniversary interview I did with Coach Boyle. 40 mistakes, 40 years. There's a link to access that at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Thanks to Sumi Seth and Nomly helping build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to Nomly.com, use the referral code STRENGTHCOACH to get started on a free 30-day trial. Thanks to AG1 from Athletic Greens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strengthcoach and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. That's going to do it for this episode. My name is Anthony Rana. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.